there's tons of fantastic human beings on the planet right now that are here to compensate. You ask, how are we going to change that? Well, look to the wisdom of all of these people that are here right now. Uh, they're, they're here right now, search them out, and it has to be through a personal choice of devotion and a genuine desire to, to, to transcend the, the reality that we're in right now. Hello everyone and welcome to my channel in, in this uh, encounters with beautiful and inspiring people, minds and, and stories. And please like and subscribe so that you too can become part of this process of getting closer and closer to the truth and uh, closer and closer to the realization of our true nature. Also, if you have something to say and want to share your message here, please contact me and let's talk. And today my guest is Claude Charlebois a multi-dimensional being as he is a poetic spiritual photographer or a visual poet and a creative lifestyler to use Claude's uh, words. But I will also add a pilot, right, Claude? You're a pilot or used to be? Uh, I like to fly. I, I think most of my life is a vertical experience. So <laughs> it's no surprise to a lot of people that uh, in sports I was doing high jump. And uh, in, uh, in my hobbies, I, I learned how to fly a plane and now I even fly drones. So, yeah, I'm, I'm a vertical kind of guy. So, in other words, you have wings, which could also mean hopefully, something yes. else. <laughs> in more ways than one, hopefully. <laughs> and you are also a yogi and a rebirther. So, welcome to the show. Thank you for accepting my invitation. Well, it's my pleasure and you're most welcome and it's great to be here. We have met once in Canada at your house in Laval. Are you still there? Same house? Yeah, same. Still same there. Same house. Yeah. Same house many years ago. And uh, we did a rebirth session. Actually, you did a rebirth session with me, which was an experience that I'll uh, never forget. It was uh, quite an, an interesting um, place to be and to access within ourselves. And um, you told me that you chose creativity mm -hmm. through photography to express or as an expression of your spirituality and that you visited sacred sites to redefine, and I quote from you, mankind's relationship to nature and to oneself. Now, we, uh, we met doing this rebirthing, but probably you have had a different start with the spirituality. I'm curious, were you on the spiritual path before rebirth? Yes, I was. Um, uh, it, it's... <laughs> I mean, we all have our own roads to spirituality. With me, it started a very, with a very, very unusual way when I was, uh, I think I was 13 years old. Uh, I studied astronomy. Uh, and for me to get a grip on the size of the universe uh, was somehow fundamental uh, in my life ethics and philosophy. So I started, uh, you know, with my brother. My brother uh, bought a telescope and, you know, we were looking at the stars and everything. And uh, my spiritual awakening, um, you know, anybody that will study the universe, the size of the universe, will come to one uh, unvarying conclusion is that it's a mathematical impossibility that we're alone. So uh, for me, it, from day one, it was a given that uh, there, there are other people out there and, and all that. And uh, when I was uh, around 15, there's a woman that came to Montreal uh, and it was on the, uh, on the news. It was on, I heard it on a radio. She was presenting a film of a UFO that she had filmed. Mm. And, you know, we're talking, uh, we're talking 1964. <laughs> so no internet, no, uh, no social networking or anything like that. And, and uh, the ability of people to be, to be able to fake uh, such things was much more limited yeah. than today. Uh, today it's, uh, there's so a what did it look like? Well, it, you can see you could see the landing gear. You could see uh, um, uh, portholes in, in the craft. It wasn't just a little light in the sky. It, it looked like this craft was about to land in her backyard. And uh, I didn't know that at the time, but um, she was friend to uh, a famous contactee uh, of the 1950s called George Adamski. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, Adamski uh, was with her when that manifestation occurred. 
Uh, I can't tell you to this day if the film is authentic or not. I mean, uh, most of these uh, these sightings are are very uh, very controversial. But the important thing is that to me, uh, what what was important is for me to understand the uh, life philosophy. Uh, so I, I put aside the the um, the um, study, scientific study of, of uh, photographically understanding if this could have been fake then. Uh, I was supplied with a small book called Cosmic Philosophy uh, that explained the, um, the would-be philosophy uh, way of life of the extraterrestrials. And so that's what I focused on. And the closest uh, philosophy uh, that, that, uh, that um, this extraterrestrial perspective brought uh, was similar to Eastern philosophies like yoga, like uh, Buddhism, etc. So I started getting into the Oriental philosophies and uh, in the 60s, I, uh, I, uh, I, I kept, uh, uh, we, had, we had a yoga camp in, uh, in the Laurentian Mountains in Quebec and I was there every summer uh, an exchange with the, the Swami there, uh, whose name was Swami Vishnu Devananda. He was a devotee of Shivananda. Oh. And so that lasted for several years. And uh, it started my path to yoga, etc. So like all of this started with a universal perspective, an extraterrestrial perspective, and ended up uh, in the Eastern philosophies. I see. And uh, how was your first experience with rebirthing then? How did you get to encounter this, uh, this path? Well, through yoga, I did a lot of uh, breathing exercises every day, like pranayama, like uh, uh, kapalabhati, and, and uh, you know, uh, breathing exercises of the like. And of course, there's uh, energetic manipulation when you do that. And the first time I did the uh, rebirthing was in the early 80s. I don't remember the year exactly, but uh, for me, uh, it was a Kundalini release. When I did my first uh, conscious breathing experience, uh, you know, it's basically connecting the breath to the exhale. And uh, it was a transcendental experience for me. So I said, if I can do this in one session, after doing maybe a decade of, uh, of uh, yogic breathing, I want to, you know, uh, study it and, and become familiar. And so I, I, I studied it for two or three years and, uh, and I, I became certified in the rebirthing. I eventually decided to, I always go to the source when I'm impressed with something. Uh, so I, I decided uh, Leonard came to Boston in 84 and uh, I, uh, I, um, I went to meet him and, and uh, I, uh, I had a weekend workshop with him in Boston. So that's the only time you met? Well, th that was the first time I met. Eventually, I, I uh, decided to travel to India and Nepal with him because uh, he studied the various aspects of uh, holistic research and even explored the possibility of uh, physical immortality. So he, uh, he, uh, he, was, uh, he had a close relationship to Herakan Babaji mm. uh, in India, and uh, which is why I decided to go there with him. But Babaji had already left his uh, physical form uh, actually the very same day that I met uh, Leonard in Boston. So that was kind of a weird, uh, weird happening. Yeah, coincidence. But can yeah. you please uh, share with me here for my for my viewers a few words about Leonard? Because you see, I met you both. Um, and I can say that there is a similar energy in, in, in both of you. Um, while on very high spiritual scales or frequencies, if you want, both of you also very grounded in reality and and some sort of strength and determination that one can feel, anyway, sensitive people like I can feel just by being in, in, in your presence. So what was your feeling, your experience of Leonard? Well, if I was to sum it up, it's very hard to sum up a person like that in people. For sure. <laughs> but but uh, if I were to use one, sen one sentence, you discovered in Leonard someone that spoke with energy instead of words. Mm-hmm. Indeed. And if you have no ability to understand that, you could not have a relationship with him, an intimate relationship with him. And I can, I can expand on that if you want, but essentially, 
uh, Leonard was an enigmatic person. Uh, he was a person that was very, very aware of uh, the energies around him, how they influenced him. Uh, um, because totally, uh, you know, anybody that's on the, the spiritual path, you know, you, 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 especially if you look at Eastern uh, practices of yogis isolating themselves uh, in nature. Um, you sort of wonder why these these people are here and how they can influence and transform the world from that perspective. And the conclusion that Leonard came to is that um, the the influence from popular reality is so strong that they will influence your emotional uh, spiritual energy. And so if you bathe in uh, in that kind of energy all the time, it's very, very hard to express something of a higher nature in yourself so he was very aware of that energy and he called it emotional energy pollution because everybody right. is carrying around uh, i would say a backpack of uh, trauma and uh this trauma creates this uh, uh this belief system that uh, concentrates on the uh, limits of the individual instead of the unlimited capabilities that we really have and until we resolve this, uh, this backpack of trauma, uh, it's very hard to go forward. And so if you hang out with, with uh, you know, the more purified you become as far as your own personal energy, the more you take on. That's exactly uh, my experience. Absolutely. Yeah, the, the more you take on the energy of the people around you, which is why Jesus uh, uh, left uh, for 40 days and 40 nights at one point, because and that's why uh, they, they say that Jesus took on the sins of the world because he was so purified. It's like communicating um, uh, vases, you know, like in physics, if you have one empty vase and you communicate with another vase that's full, they will empty each other to create a balance. So energetically, from a holistic standpoint, this is what happens with people that high, are very high spiritually. And, and you get rid of that and you equalize that through spiritual purification. Uh, which involve practices like meditation, breathing, uh, and um, uh, entertaining a relationship with the basis manifestation of the divine in matter, which is earth, hair, water, and fire, which, yeah. is why, which is why nature is so important, because as we treat nature, we treat ourselves, and we're so disconnected from our own personal energy that uh, we have this uh, unconscious death hurge. It's like a suicide pact that we have with our bodies, uh, and then we express this through smoking, through eating processed food, uh, and uh, leading very, very unhealthy lives from a standpoint of physicality. Uh, and so we treat the planet the same way. And until we realize that we are the nature we are abusing, uh, it's going to continue the same way that it is now, which is why in the photography, I try to redefine the, the relationship that man has to nature because it's really the, the relationship that he has towards himself. Wonderful. So in two words, for those listening and don't know what rebirthing is or conscious breathing is, what is it to you? How did you experience it? Well, rebirthing is, uh, is being one with, uh, with the universal energy through the breath. It is, it is, uh, not inhibiting the inhale and, and connecting it with the exhale so that it becomes a wave. It becomes a wave of energy with you that you surrender to and you increase the voltage, the pranic voltage within oh. you. Yeah. Uh, so, that, so that it floods you uh, with ecstasy until it meets a blockage. And when it meets a blockage, it becomes pain until you heal or resolve that pain and uh, surrender uh, the, uh, the trauma to the universal flow of energy. That's the and, way it works. And that happens through the breathing process. Surrendering is happening through the breathing. Exactly. You're, you're increasing the flow of prana or uh, cosmic energy within your whole physical. It's a physical, emotional, and spiritual experience. It's, it's an experience that hits you on all levels. This is why it's so powerful. That's now, Leonard described, described it as a physical experience of the divine. It was indeed. It was indeed. And remember when we talked last time, 
uh, I mentioned to you, and I won't take the time to, to tell you my dreams again, but uh, I told you that I had uh, these two dreams of Babaji. And for our viewers who never heard of him, Haidak and Babaji is described as the great manifestation of the divine on earth, the supreme teacher or the Maha avatar. Um, what was your experience with this being, even if you didn't get to meet him in person? What was the result of you being aware of his existence on earth, to put it that way? Um, well, Babaji initially, um, instilled as much doubt in my mind as he did um, proof. Uh, I think that anybody who's on a spiritual path will want to find someone that will offer you a higher perspective mm. so that you can better understand uh, how the universe works and who you are and what you're doing here. And that's the whole objective of, of spiritual research. Most of humanity uh, finds this uh, or expresses this research through religion because it's the exoteric part, and I mean exoteric yes. part of, uh, of spirituality. Uh, it's a common belief, it's a common accepted belief about life, ethics, philosophies, and so on. And studying individual masters, people that seem to uh, display a mastery of, of uh, physicality, uh, of spirituality from a higher perspective, is really basically the study of esoteric uh, spirituality. Uh, trying to find out and, and, and reach out for Babaji, I, I had to have confidence in uh, Leonard's perspective because he had been uh, with him, I think, at that point, seven or eight years in a row. And of course, he speaks uh, at length of, of his experience and, and the miracles that Babaji performed uh, in his presence. Um, and so I guess that my confidence or my insanity to meet such a person, even though he had left his physical form, uh, was greater than my uh, doubts. Okay. Uh, Babaji told himself, if, if you come to me in doubt, I will increase your doubt, doubt beyond measure. But if you come to me in love, I will show you a dimension of love you've never seen before. Mm. Uh, so on a leap of faith in 1987, I, I went to meet uh, uh, Leonard in, in India. And we subsequently flew to Kathmandu. And then we flew to the Himalayas to trek and uh, find uh, a new manifestation of Babaji that was apparently on the border of Nepal and Tibet on a mountain called Shisha Pangma. Now, there's a whole story about that that you can read uh, in, in uh, uh, Leonard Orr's biography called The Eternal Breath. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the author is Paula Churchill. I think she's a lady from Australia. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you can, you can read about this, the story of our trekking in, in the Himalayas together. Uh, and uh, I did not meet, uh, I mean, Babaji didn't appear to me phys um, in a physical form like uh, he did for Paula. Paula Churchill challenged Babaji to, to uh, show her something in, in her life that would... Uh, Confirm, uh, yeah. yeah. For her, and, and Babaji appeared to her in her apartment. But uh, for me, uh, after trekking uh, day and night for a few days uh, with Leonard, um, I, I came back to a base camp of some Polish climbers at around 15, 16,000 feet. Never made it to Tibet, but that's another story because the communists had closed the borders at the time because there were some manifestations in Lhasa. Uh, and uh, I, I, I meditated uh, uh, at this altitude uh, and um, a bird landed on my, I asked for a message from Babaji and a bird landed on my shoulder, on my left shoulder and uh, walked all over my body down to my feet and then uh, left. it came back up to my left shoulder and flew off. And it's the only time in my life that a wild bird landed on me uh, and, um, you know, I started crying <laughs> and, uh, that for me was, uh, my answer from Babaji. I, I didn't meet him physically, but in the form I would suppose of an animal, but that's very subjective and you can interpret. But, it way. I mean, is there anything else in the spiritual experience, but a subjective experience? 
Yeah. I mean, well, it will always remain highly subjective. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yes, this is your own great, inner, yeah. your own inner system of, of uh, recognition yeah. mm -hmm. and acknowledgement yeah. and awareness that will certify that as, a, as an experience, a spiritual experience or not. So yeah. now there is something that I'd like to share with you and our viewers, because preparing for the interview, I uh, came across uh, a booklet I showed it to you earlier, which is called Haida Khan Babaji Speaks. And it is probably, just to find my glasses, it's probably the, a book, a booklet that I bought from Leonard. And um, that will introduce us to the next part of our conversation, uh, which is what's happening today. And this is why I want to read because it's, it's highly interesting. Um, I don't know if you've read it, but please uh, listen to this. There's, uh, there's little chapters. It's like little poems. So I'm going to read only three of them. They're very short. This one is called Hypocrisy. It says like this, beware of the nations and their leaders who talk about peace new world order, compassion, love, caring, and sharing, while all the time, either overtly or occultly, they express unjust intolerance. They uphold double standards. They hunger for power and control over the poor, the hungry, the disadvantaged, and the helpless. Such dangerous ones speak of peace, but hunger for war. They talk of love, but practice hate. They talk of brotherly love, but behave like tyrants and spread untruths to mislead the masses. There's another chapter here, which is longer, but I'm going to step into the Mahakranti, translated as the great destruction. And he says like this, the signal for the Mahakranti or the great destruction has been issued. No one and nothing can stop it now. Before long, all the bad elements, all evil will be eradicated. Then shall real peace, truth, love, and purity prevail. I am now completing the second half of my work. Soon it shall be over. Victory is assured. And the last one, which is even shorter, it's called the new world. The new world is for the faithful children of the divine. All ugliness, impurities, ungodliness, falsehood, distortions, injustices, sufferings, and evilness will be a thing of the past. The time of liberation from darkness is very close. So be prepared, be flexible, and expect the unexpected. Now, I read this several times and I had goosebumps every time I read it because when did he leave his body, in 1985? No, the 14th of February, 1984. I see. This is when you were supposed to go. That's why you remember the date. Well, that's the day I, I decided to go meet him in India. Yeah, and, that's... Uh, mm. Since there was no internet in 19... Well, there was in 1984, but it was rather slow. Uh, and um, I, met, I learned two weeks later that he had left his physical form uh, on the very day I decided to visit him. <laughs> It's and I had like a dream, that. and I had a dream of the funerals. Remember, I told you about yeah. it. Very yeah. interesting. Very interesting. It's it's in incredible though how we are all connected. And you mentioned the doubt. I think, I think this is a characteristics of uh, a characteristic of our modern, uh, like the Western world. We have less capacity to to surrender, less capacity to devotion. Right. Yes, devotion. Mm -hmm. So we are and, and less devotion. equipped with devotion in the West. Um, yeah. and we, we want to understand things. We want to judge things. We want to rationalize them. So coming back to what I just read, how do you place yourself in this changing world? And how do you look at what is going on mm -hmm. at a personal level? Well, um, you, you can view things on a personal level, but, uh, at the stage that I am in my physical experience, I try to not interpret from the, the personal level, but from a universal level. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we briefly talked the other time of uh, the different ways to perceive reality. Yes. And um, this is related to that. Um, I, I've broken it down in, in four stages in spite of the fact that there are many, uh, as many perceptions of reality as there are sentient beings in the universe and every perspective is unique. 
Yeah. But in our manifestation on earth, I mean, there's, to me, there's four phases. There's family reality, popular reality, individual reality, mm -hmm. and cosmic or universal reality. Now, when, when looking at the events of today, the first realization is that you have to realize that you chose to be here right now, okay, from a cosmic perspective. Uh, I remember doing a, a, a conscious breathing session and remembering my state of mind when uh, I knew I was going to incarnate. And my feeling was that uh, I had just won the lottery because the evolutionary opportunities that we have in the present are immense. It's like living three lifetimes at one. If you look at just the uh, scientific and technological advances of uh, of the last uh, 50, 60, 70 years. Uh, it's, yeah. it's, a, it's astonishing. It's astonishing. Uh, and uh, like I remember, I mean, my physical form is, is uh, 70 years young. Yes, I remember. Yes, in, in rebirth, we do that. We don't say we are 50 years old. We say we're 50 years young. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and uh, and I, re I remember in my youth, uh, um, milk being delivered uh with a horse and buggy okay and i have an aunt that's 100 years old 100 years young and she remembers like traveling on horseback and in the same lifetime she's seen someone go on the moon you know and and uh satellites land on mars so that that's the extent of what we've gone through in the life now now obviously because of this acceleration we're going to we're going to go through a lot of different experiences Mm -hmm. And we have to realize that the people that are in power that Babaji described in your quote mm. uh, have uh, a, a disease. Uh, the accumulation of wealth and the accumulation of power for the sake of power is, is, a, uh, is a disease. Uh, and this disease sort of radiates toward the rest of popular reality. And we accept that. We, we, if we don't question and, and if we don't try to think outside of the box, we accept that as being normal. Like, for instance, the concept of scarcity. Uh, scarcity is a human invention that is created by uh, the psychopaths that uh, are, the, are governing us today. In any life form in the universe, there's always... Uh, 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 a plenty full of resources or else the species would disappear. Yeah. Yes. There's always an abundance. Uh, we, we don't live this abundance. I mean, we all know now that 50% uh, of the life uh, of the world's resources uh, are owned by 2% of the people, which is insanity. And, 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 you know, there's strong defenders of all kinds of systems, whether it be capitalism or socialism. Yeah. But none of them uh, to this point have worked because uh, of this insanity and because of our level of conscious awareness. Uh, we're not living our lives from a cosmic perspective. We're, we're living our lives from a family and popular reality perspective. And so when uh, this gradually changes, and it will because of the situation that is offered us for, you know, like it, it's, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to realize that a virus is essentially, whether it's man-made or naturally made, uh, is, is a way of cleansing. It's a cleanser. The, 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 the planet is, is, is cleansing itself because it's sick, because of us. And we have something to learn in that. And what we need to learn is find what our true identity is. And the relationship that we, uh, we entertain with the rest of the universe through uh, correct perspective, uh, what I call presence or source, uh, is made more intimate to us. And it becomes impossible to live uh, the way we are living now when this higher consciousness uh, inhabits your, uh, your, your life, your lifestyle and your life philosophy. Well, uh, one of the, one of the uh, books that we've discussed is the uh, 2150. Yes. Uh, it's a book uh, that was written by a lady in the 70s called Thea Alexander. And uh, it describes a society that, that lives from uh, a cosmic perspective. And these people have decided to concentrate. Uh, I mean, they've resolved all uh, all form of, of scare, scarcity. Uh, and and uh, the logical part of the book and the novel is that a certain part of society wants to continue living uh, 
uh, the way that we live now, which is called micro society. And the society that decides to live uh, from an eco ecological, spiritual standpoint uh, are called the macro society. Mm -hmm. and, and to me, uh, what is described in the book, the lifestyle that is described in the book, and also the interrelationship between man and woman uh, that is described is that in this book is uh, the perfect uh, answer to what my soul says it should be you know mm. like we, we we should not uh, love someone from the standpoint of dependency yes we, we should love so someone from the standpoints of overflowing and what that does is it, it enables the other person to be who that person is without judgments without conditions without ju uh, uh you know programming our, ourselves for uh, for failure uh, so it's an interesting book um, um i think it's out of print right now it sold millions of copies in the 70s and there's all kinds of other stories around that because uh apparently we have uh, some some people that listen to some radio interviews of john lennon in at the 30th anniversary of his death and he apparently admitted in an interview that he had written the, the song Imagine uh, uh, after uh, reading that book. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, uh, it's a book that should be republished. And, and if some people want some copies of it, I might have a few that are left. And uh, the, the author, uh, I became friends with the author. I, yeah, I so can you please, so it, the, the, the title of the book is 2150 AD, right? And who's the author? What's the name of the author? The author is Theo Alexander. It's more than a novel because it, it, it offers people what's called macro philosophy. And it shows what could happen if we live from a universal perspective. That's interesting. And how did you get in touch with this uh, book first time? How come well, you got interested? Somebody, somebody suggested it uh, to me in uh, around 1975. And uh, I got a hold of a copy. I read it and I was so impressed with it that, uh, like I said, I always go back to the source. I got on a plane. Uh, Thea Alexander only gave a three day workshop once a year and that was uh, Labor Day. So the next Labor Day, I hopped on a plane. I went to meet her and uh, I, uh, I went to uh, her whole uh, uh, workshop. I did that uh, a second time, I think 10 years later, and uh, maybe in the last seven or eight years, I visited her in Arizona. Uh, and now she's moved to Virginia. And um, we still have we still speak every every month, every other week. And um, she would love to meet her. I'd love to to get in touch with her. If yeah, possible. Yeah. Well, um, she doesn't give interviews anymore. Um, yes. You know, some people in in Istanbul, uh wanted her to to talk about her her book and uh she she can't you know she's well into her 80s and she's had uh, i think uh, uh health problems along the way and she she can't express herself uh you know that well anymore that well. so but I, you, I i did the the conference for her in, in so you're um, still organizing these workshops on her in her name do you? Um, no, they're not workshops. They're just uh, what we're doing now. Some people that are interested in finding out about the uh, the philosophy behind the book, uh, mm -hmm. uh, we do Zoom meetings like that, and there's X number of people that um, that uh, tune in. That's excellent. So that could be an idea. So for everybody uh, watching, if you're interested to find out more about 2150 AD, you can uh, contact uh, Claude. I'm going to. Uh, add all the links uh, in the comment section below. But can you please at least share with us a little hint into, because this was a, a question that I, I, I had planned for later on in the conversation, but since we got here, because one of my concerns um, in, in, in today's world is technology. She had mentioned these um, new concepts in the book, which is similar to IA, right? Central intelligence or something of the sort. Yeah. Well, so, um, so how is the, the relationship uh, between spirituality and technology? That was my question, as presented in the book. Well, the way it's presented in the book is um, anything that is created in the universe is not positive or negative. Oh. It's, it's the conscious awareness of how you use it that is. And it's the same, like internet was started from, for, uh, it, it was invented from the military project, you know. Uh, a lot of inventions came from the military. 
Most of uh, it, because yeah. because they live in a different uh, they live in a totally different um, economic reality than we do. I know mm -hmm. because I've worked in four levels of government in my life, and uh, money is meaningless at that level. Right? Uh, example: If if uh, if the United States decide to spend 500 billion dollars to have the fastest plane, they will find the 500 billion dollars. Notwithstanding the fact that with 500 billion dollars, you could feed everybody in the United States, educate everybody in the United States for decades to come. And people accept that because they're so paranoid uh, because of national security. I won't get into that, but it's an example. Maybe in a future interview. <laughs> Maybe. But um, so wh when it comes to technology, uh, 2150 AD describes the internet uh, decades before it was actually invented. Unbelievable. They call it, as you said, central intelligence. Now, uh, the lifestyle that's described in 2150 is everybody is healthy. Everybody's beautiful. The average height of every man is six foot six. The average height of every woman is around six feet. Uh, half, half of their day is, uh, uh, is uh, spent in social interaction and physical exercise. And the other half is towards education. Uh, they don't have formal schools. People live in communes that are called uh, alphas or deltas. And uh, they, uh, they interchange, uh, uh, they have, there's an inter a social interchange on all times, but they assign a personal evolution tutor, okay? And nobody in that society can hide their level of evolution because the clothes they wear, I mean, it's fiction, but, you know, con just consider how neat it would be to have a society like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, I mean, the, the garment that you wear enhances your auric field so you can see someone's aura. So uh, you can't hide your level of evolution and, and there's, there's no hypocrisy because everything is an open book and you surrender to it. So the people that are uh, governing mm -hmm. are the wisest people. They're not, they're, they're, they're not there for personal gain because wow. they can see that this is... Uh, a disease that's been er eradicated a long time ago. Yeah. And the people that are in, uh, uh, at the top of the uh, teaching uh, are, are there because they radiate something that's of a higher level. They're basically yogis or, or uh, Jesuses or, uh, or Buddhas, uh, Buddhas uh, and, and they guide the society towards a higher, a higher evolution. And uh, everybody's assigned a partner uh, uh, and, and expresses their sexuality through that partner. And, and there's no possess possession. If at one point in the relationship, uh, they find that uh, the, the person is not right, your personal evolution tutor will guide you towards another partner. And there's no jealousy or anything like that because they see the grander picture from a universal perspective. So the technology there is used to eliminate boring tasks and for educational purposes. I mean, you look at the internet, it does three things. Mm -hmm. It entertains, it enables communication, and it enables education. And the two things that are most precious in education is to never stifle or hurt your desire to learn, grow, and evolve. And uh, the best and the second thing that's most important is to educate people to self-educate for the rest of their lives. Uh, that's the two most important. If you, if you retain from your education, whether it be an academic uh, education or formal education, if you retain the desire to keep learning your whole life, and there's a lot of people come out of school, they never touch a book for the rest of their lives. And that's such, it's a shame, it's a shame. And, and to, to never damage that, that need to want to educate and then to give the means. And, and the best means to self-educate is the internet. And you can find out about any subject, but you need to have this, this will to, 
to self-educate for the rest of your life. And this is how you become a multidimensional human is by developing all of these resources, using all of these resources at your disposal. Artificial intelligence will render boring tasks a thing of the past. So uh, you, you can use all of these to, to, for negative ends. Again, it's a question of conscious awareness. Do you want to live your life from the st standpoint of a psychopath that wants to become a multi-trillionaire? I mean, what is well, the... We're, we're already there. I mean, yes, we're, we're living <laughs> so how life. are we going over this? How are we going to get to the other side then? How do you well, see it? Be, well, I mean, in Star Trek, there's no more money, right? You look at the, the song Imagine, that was apparently... Uh, inspired uh, by the book. Yeah. Inspired by the book. There, there, there's no more religion. There's no more government. There's no more country. There's no more heaven and hell. I mean, that's what the, the song speaks about. Yeah. And how do, you get, how do you get there? By changing one thought at a time. And that you, one you, thought at a time. Yes, by doing meditation, by incorporating a spiritual discipline in your life that works for you. I mean, it has to be fun. It has to be pleasant. Uh, Thea Alexander, the author of the book, doesn't believe in working. She believes in play and work, which she, she contracted to plork. So if you want to entertain your desire to learn all the time, you plork in life. So you have to learn how plorking works. <laughs> this, this way you'll never, you'll never turn your back from learning because it will be a pleasurable experience, you see. Uh, so, so that's how you do it. You, you do it one thought at a time. You observe your belief system. Uh, and, and it's using also the right language. Language is very important. I, I met an extraordinary man a few years ago. His name was Kenneth Mills. Because I had entertained a relationship on a creative level with Leonardo da Vinci, and you can do that. If you're a musician and you study Chopin, you can, uh, you can carry the, 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 the intellectual knowledge you learned from Chopin and try to tune in to his vibration. And in your meditation and dreams, you can actually entertain a different relationship. And I did that with Da Vinci. So I manifested a, a living Da Vinci in my life. His, his name was Kenneth Mills. And he was a multidimensional being that was my personal creative mentor for about 601 days until he passed uh, and he left his physical form. Uh, and we were so close that I was there when he left his physical form because uh, he lived in Toronto and I flew down to, to, uh, to Toronto uh, because I felt that I needed to see him. And, and uh, it's an act of a divine gift, if you wish. I was able to share his last moments in, in, this, in this world, but he also thought he was a poet. He was a, a man that could answer questions in rhymes for 15 minutes at a time. I've never seen that in another human being. So there's tons of fantastic human beings on the planet right now that are here to compensate. You ask, how are we going to change that? Well, look to the wisdom of all of these people that are here right now uh, they're, they're not yet heads of governments. I mean, uh, it happens once in a while like Gandhi did, but uh, they're, they're here right now, search them out, and it has to be through a personal choice of devotion and a genuine desire to, to, to transcend the, the reality that we're in right now. Uh, I, I'm presently reading, uh, reading, writing a book or attempting to read a book, and, and the title is going to be There is So Much More. And there is so much more. Start by studying the structure of the universe and, 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 uh, uh, and, and look at this through the, the perspective of quantum physics. Like we're, we're, we're learning all kinds of fun things through quantum physics right now that is explaining to us the, the, not only the size of the universe, but the nature of our universe, yes. uh, the possibilities uh, that one day will react uh, to a much broader spectrum of, of, uh, of uh, a vibrational uh, uh, manifestation. Also, the possibility of alternate universes that our senses cannot react to, et cetera, et cetera. And, and from a, a perspective of a creator, uh, uh, somebody that's into creativity, that's such fantastic news. 
because what quantum physics is really telling us is two main things. First, we're all linked. We're part of, of something that's called the uh, uh, universal pool of energy. Uh, and uh, the second thing is that thought has an influence on matter. There's a lot of scientific ex experiments that, uh, that conclude that uh, our thoughts has an influence on matter. So from a creative standpoint, that's a, a fantastic resource that we can use to change ourselves and to change the world. Sure, but this you see, many people are dominated by fear because of these rapid changes. And and when we talked last time, you man mentioned that in the context of COVID, we kind of we kind of forced to look at this concept of fear, of victimhood, um, of what health is. And uh, you said that uh, we are forced to see how the popular reality is manipulating and enslaving us. Um, could you please, because we went th quickly through the four perspectives, but for the viewers, uh, better understanding, what do you mean by popular perspective, actually? <laughs> Well, if we go through, I mean, these are perfectly arbitrary and, and, and there's something that came up for me. In oh, my for sure, but to you, yeah. And, and there's nothing empirical about that. But when I looked at the four uh, stages uh, of, of perceiving reality, uh, the, first, the first level is family reality. It's basically from zero to five years old. The, mm -hmm. the, your entire reality is your family. Uh, if your family is loving, nurturing, and, and centered around uh, evolution, then it's a fantastic time in your life, and it sets the tone for the rest of, of, of your manifestation. It's, it's, very, uh, it's like the base of the pyramid. Mm -hmm. If you live in a very uh, negative, because some families are very, very negative, yeah. uh, and, and you go through traumatic experiences, then it will also affect the rest of your life, and you need to clean that up. Uh, but, you know, uh, that's where your, your first ethics and your first under, understanding of this manifestation occurs. It can be positive or negative all the time. As soon as you start going to school, you become, you become, uh, uh, you, you, you start touching popular reality. Popular reality is how the world works, uh, language, uh, where we are uh, right now uh, from the standpoint of life philosophy, ethics, technology, et cetera, et cetera, how society works. And then you intermix all of that knowledge with your family values, your family reality. I'd say that about 80% of the people never grow out of, um, of these two stages. They never grow out of popular, uh, popular reality. Popular reality is you're born, you, you exchange with your family, you go to school, you get a job, you get married, you get a family, you retire and you die. That's popular reality. And what you've experienced in that, in that time span is limited by the belief system of the collective. I see, I see. Mm -hmm. As soon as a human being is given a little more resources, and they can be any kind of resources. As long as, uh, uh, as soon as human beings get more uh, uh, economic resources, uh, spiritual resources, emotional resources, intellectual resources, they realize one thing is that their perspective, their perspective on the universe is unique, and they can change it at will. So this is the the, the level. Uh, even uh, e even if you don't have uh, uh, financial resources uh, that are spectacular, artists realize that they realize they can transform reality. They can create works of art that show a different perspective than what is offered in popular reality. Mm -hmm. And so they achieve a certain level of fame from that or complete anonymity depending on the timing uh, in which they express their creativity. Uh, and so, and even like every millionaire, every multimillionaire that I've met, and I've met many of them, they all create their own personal reality. Unfortunately, a, a lot of millionaires don't know what to do with the resources that they have. Uh, resources that we have are meant to be shared so that we can transform the lives and influence the lives of other people. Whether you're a singer and you're, and you're sharing your voice, whether you're a poet or sharing your poetry, whether you're a photographer and, 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 and you're sharing your, your, your visual imagery. If you're a multimillionaire and you don't use this resources that is lent to you because you know we are born naked and we die naked, 
Yeah. And what's important is what you do with the resources that are lent to you in this span of time. This is all, the only mutual fund you bring with yourself is what you did with that resource. And I call it evolutionary voltage. Mm-hmm. That accompanies you for your next manifestation. But popular reality is that, and personal reality is the springboard towards something different, something higher. And from that standpoint, if you're lucky and you have the impetus to do that, you look at universal reality. The first step is studying the universe and see how it's structured from all levels, even from a a vibrational level. And, And you realize at that point that all of the Uh, all of the lower perceptions are extremely, extremely limited. Yeah. And and when you realize the limit of that, you say, how can a human being base his whole life uh, on a single book? Like, for instance, some people become fanatic about what's written in the Bible or the Quran or the Old Testament. Uh, And if you realize the size of the universe... We, 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 we know that, that, that the speed of uh, light is 186,000 miles a second. But what is this? You know, like the, 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 uh, the space station goes around the Earth once every 90 minutes. Well, the speed of life is going seven and a half times around the Earth in one second. You know, uh, our spaceship go to the moon right now takes roughly three days. But at the speed of life, light, it... It, uh, it takes one and a half seconds. Uh, it, it took Voyager roughly 30 years to exit the solar system. <laughs> At the speed of light, it takes about three and a half hours. So, and our galaxy is so wide that to go from one spot to the other of the galaxy would take uh, something, I think it's, uh, I don't remember if it's 100,000 years or 100 million years at the speed of light, at that speed. So. And that's only one galaxy. We now know that there's hundreds of billions of galaxies. So how do you live your life from that standpoint? But how do, you, how do you get to see, to look at things like this? Because me, I'm talking, I'm the, playing the devil's advocate here. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, people watching and, you know, they're overwhelmed with their problems. So how does it help you? Uh, to think of the, 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 the greatness of the universe if you don't have enough money to pay your rent tomorrow. See, the, how do you make that leap? Well, the whole planet right now is undergoing this change because, um, because of COVID. Uh, and the, the, the material situation is very, very complicated and very hard. Um, I don't have, I don't have uh, all the answers from a practical standpoint. What I try and do is, is look at the problem from a higher perspective. Higher perspective. Uh, yeah. Uh, and I try to... And trust that. I, I, I try to take responsibility for everything that's happened in my life. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I try to not judge any situation from a positive or negative standpoint. My perspective is if, if I'm in contact with presence or with the source, everything will be given on to me if... If I do my homework and I participate in life uh, the way I should, instead of being bogged down and judging a situation and emitting negative thoughts and everything. I see. I, I've done that in my life. I, I've, I've had three life-threatening diseases. Uh, and I every time that ha- this has happened to me, I've asked myself, why did I manifest that? What do I have to learn from that? And every time the answer came, and I believed that I integrated what I needed to learn from that situation so that it doesn't repeat again, you know, Uh, and and I I will go through different uh, times, uh, different uh, experiences that I could turn negative, but I try not to do that because I am responsible for that. I take responsibility for everything that's happening to me Mm -hmm. and I can shift And as soon as I shift and I look at it from a higher universal perspective, the reality changes. It's inevitable. And I've proven that on on so many occasions. And it's worked for me in my life. And there's all kinds of help that you can get. As as our consciousness shifts, 
the insanity uh, of wealth accumulation will, will shift to uh, uh, sharing everything, every resource that we have. And that is the only solution. That's the to, only solution. To look at what we have and what we can share. We are never, we are never uh, uh, worthless. Uh, there's always something we can contribute to our environment. You know, there, there's a saying that you can never resolve a problem from the perspective it was created. It's impossible because you'll keep doing the same mistakes over and over again. And that's theoretically a definition of stupidity. Mm -hmm. okay? So if you want to resolve a situation, you have to think outside of the box. You have to look at your, your perception of reality and say, well, this hasn't worked up to now. I have to change something. Yes. And the way to change that is a higher consciousness, is a higher perspective. Looking, and it's all about how you look at yourself. Some people are so positive. I have such an, a positive image of who they are that nothing can destroy them. They, they're always optimistic. They're always focusing on the, 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 the glass being half full instead of half empty. And, and, and the results uh, prove that this is the way to go. So it's one thought at a time. It's one habit at a time. Uh, and even if you're, you feel your resources uh, uh, are, are, are not many, uh, shift your, your thought. Um, instead of always saying, well, I need this. I want them to give me that. What do you have to share? If you start contributing, even if it's only half an hour a week of your time to making the world better, The world will thank world you. would feed you back. Yeah, you said that, uh, that the point of your life is actually to recognize your identity through these resources that were lent to you. And, and you mentioned that, that the heart accumulates the feedback and that we accumulate this, how did you call it? Evolutionary voltage? Exactly. Yeah. So basically it's by giving, by sharing that which you, uh, your, your skills, your talents, your gifts, yeah. then something accumulates and then you kind of get it back. The cosmic okay. bank account, that's exactly, that's what you said. <laughs> yes, it's a cosmic bank account. And um, um, the beauty of this, the fun part of it also, is that um, when, when you're sharing, uh, you realize that from a holistic standpoint, we're not only receivers and emitters of energy, but there's a, there's a component of human beings and, and the accumulator is in the heart. We mm -hmm. accumulate. We accumulate because when we transform someone's life through imagery or singing or money or anything, we, that person has a burst of compassion and love. And that's vibrational. It comes back to you. Okay. You can believe that in that or not if you want, but you can prove it to yourself also. Uh, um, I'll, I'll just say a very, very short thing. Uh, um, uh, I've met uh, another great soul, Greg Braden. Uh, he's all over the internet. He is a scientific uh, spiritual researcher. I met him as and, well. Yeah, I, I, met, I, had, I had a nice lunch with him and we exchanged. And he told me that at, on 9-11, uh, there's something that very weird happened on the planet is that for the three days following the, the tragic day of 9-11, um, there are instruments on the earth that, um, that uh, um, measure the electromagnetic field of the planet. And that's supposed to be a constant. It's not supposed to change or vary uh, from one day to the next. And he said that the magnetometers on the planet, the three days following, uh, went haywire. They had peaks. And he explains it that there was such a movement of compassion on the planet for what happened. It was so generalized throughout the whole planet. Everybody was focusing on 9-11, unless you lived in Papua New, New Guinea or something like that. Yeah. that it, it created this magnetic influence. And he says, this comes from the heart. And so if we can have that kind of influence magnetically, uh, that means we are influencing each other uh, every day, every day. Uh, and so, Uh, we accumulate something when we transform people's lives. When we get feedback of love, it, it helps us, it changes us. So that's a, a lot of fun too, to consider. So and I, I think that if we bring this on the, uh, when we leave this physical form, I think that what this produces 
is uh, this, uh, it ensures the nobility of our next manifestation. Mm. It ensures that uh, we will have more of a say. I mean, the universe rejoices when, uh, when we, we share our, our creativity. I mean, mm. we're part of something that we call creation. And the basic nature of creation is to create. Therefore, if we focus our lives on creativity, I think the source rejoices in that and gives us more resources so that we can, because the universe knows about itself through us, through our yes. creativity, through emulation of the creative nature of the universe. The universe is expanding. We've proven that scientifically. And it expands through the refinement and expansion of creativity. So we're given more resources when we realize that and we build on that from one manifestation to the other. Uh, and that enables us to expand our consciousness, to expand, have, have access to a greater mountaintop, if you will. Yes. So that we see more and more. And then there's more rejoicing in this because we expand with the universe. So that's the way I see it. So you mentioned that uh, when we create, we are closer to the source and that creativity is the, the highest form of religion. You mentioned that you are giving some sort of seminars or workshops on creativity and that uh, there is one, this one first lesson that you're teaching uh, on how we are influenced by the perception of reality. So how can one tap into this creativity you can work out your body to be very very strong very agile uh and it's the same with your creative ability and it's a it's it's false to think that uh some people are creative and some are not uh, i would have to say some people are trained predisposed to to manifest yes. their creativity and, and then again i mean i come back to resources uh, you need resources to be creative we, we will come to a point where we will uh, be orient, oriented and focused on sharing what we have, and that, that will create the expansion. So the first thing to do is, yes, to realize the resources that you haven't used these. And uh, we, we cannot equate resources with uh, material, uh, materiality or, or money only because uh, the creative resources, every human being is creative. Whether you are applying your creativity for survival, which is, has been the norm for millions of years, I mean, but uh, you have to realize that the, the, the first creative societies were societies that did not spend 12 hours a day feeding themselves and clothing themselves and uh, putting a roof over their heads. They, they had access to food, water easily, and then they started to have leisure time and express uh, their creativity artistically. So that's the basis. Uh, and of course, there's a training around that. You can develop a creative lifestyle that will uh, educate you to uh, have artistic practices, spiritual practices that interlock with your creativity. Uh, I am never more happy in my life uh, when I, uh, except when I'm creating something, when I, I feel this, this link with the source and I actually feel this communion, it's, I think creativity is the highest form of communion with the divine, with God, whatever you want to call it. I call it the source. I call it presence with a capital P. Yes. And when I feel this presence, I feel it. I recognize it in myself. How, and How do you recognize that? You recognize, you recognize the divine imprint in everything you are, in the physicality, in the emotionality, in the spirituality. You feel the link. It's, it's like it's, it's a communion uh, that I felt in conscious breathing uh, because I feel this experience of energetic it God. Feels, it feels different, right? It's a different frequency. It's a different vibe. You yeah, feel like you're in tune with something. You feel you don't yeah. think negative thoughts about yourself anymore. Well, You're well, one with everything. So how did you get into the tonal visions? How did you start with the taking pictures? Let's talk a few minutes. I think we're getting over the, the time, but I want to mention uh, your main, uh, is that your main activity, tonal visions? Well, it's my main aspiration. Um, yes. uh, I, 
I, I started Tonal Vision about 12, some odd years ago, but through my relationship with my creative mentor, Mr. Mills. Mm. And uh, I, I understood one thing when I, I was with him is that whether you are in any kind of activity uh, or job, as soon as you go beyond the mastery of the technical aspects of your job, you can instill in your energy uh, a master plan. And the master plan is, uh, how would I say, um, a challenge that you give towards your, yourself to explore possibilities that you think are impossible within yourself. Mm-hmm. And so you use the resources that you have, the talents that you have to try and help and share with the rest of the universe what they are. So I had been in photography most of my life. Uh, I, 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 I've been a professional photographer for, you know, about 45 years. And I, I but, you know, I've concentrated on uh, advertising photography and I made a good life. Uh, I, I made a good living with that. Uh, I had my own studio with uh, 12 people working with me at one time. And uh, again, the, the, uh, the um, technology and the uh, modus operandi of photography has changed dramatically in the last 20 years. So I had to change with that. For sure. Uh, I invested a lot of money in digital stuff, et cetera, et cetera. So I had to adapt, uh, you know, or else I would have become a dinosaur. And I, at one point, you know, through the relationship with my, uh, my creative mentor, uh, wanted to create sort of a, a master plan around what I want to express spiritually through uh, the resources that I had and, and the talent that I had w- was photography. Mm-hmm. So I, I decided to, um, I decided to, uh, meditate on that and I came to the conclusion that uh, we live in a very 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 visual world right now I mean we communicate basically with two uh, two things images and words and uh, my creative ma- mentor was a master at words so my, my, my thinking was if I can use my uh, my images and his words uh, they're the two most uh, used uh, methods of communication and express the creativity through that, uh, then I think that would be a win-win situation. So I took his poetry. I mean, I love his poetry. If, if uh, he, uh, he's got a CD that, that people can find through the, uh, the Kenneth Mills Foundation, uh, their, their website is uh, www dot kgm foundation dot org is uh, poetry can be uh, can be listened to through a CD called the tonal garment of the word and so yeah I was inspired by his poetry and I did a series of maybe 50 60 photographs based on the poetry mm-hmm. and uh, I, I want to create a multimedia project uh, from from that but It requires over six digits of money because I want to transform it into, I don't know if you know what projection mapping is, but it's basically taking gigantic photographs and animating them. Mm -hmm. So that's been the dream uh, for for 10, 12 years. The the, the foundation uh, gave me a certain amount of money uh, I got sort of uh, to start the project. And, And so I traveled to sacred places with a team of people from the foundation to photograph uh, the oldest tree on the planet, to photograph all, all uh, beautiful wonders that have their own story and, and, and people can identify with them and, and realize that uh, when we interrelate with the nature at its uh, vital level, uh, that a, they can be agents and tra- of transformation with us. Yes. Uh, they're all pleasant. If we go back to Leonard Orr's vision of earth, air, water, and fire as being uh, agents of purification. You can purify your personal energy by entertaining a relationship with fire, entertaining a relationship with air, with the earth, and um, it's it's uh, it's transformational. It's using the physical proponents of the divine in matter to transform yourself, even from a physical standpoint. So all of this is is uh, is is part of my way. It's my path. It's uh, it's personal research that I love to share. 
Uh, if people want to talk uh, for a day, a half a day, two days yes. on creativity, mm-hmm. I, I don't. I don't put any effort into organizing and promoting that. People ask me, and then we organize something depending on the number of participants. And we can look at the creative lifestyle. I can talk of of rebirthing. I can talk of the macro lifestyle, which are all things that have transformed my life. And it's all about sharing. It's all about sharing and making it available. And that's the that's the part uh, and the space that I'm in right now. For those listening, if you want to have a, a conference or a short seminar online or in, in person with Claude, you can contact him uh, directly at the email address that I'm going to share here in the comment uh, box. And before ending, Claude, do you have a last word to, to add to those watching you now who are looking forward towards some good news in terms of what's going on today? What would you tell them? Um, I, I'd be tempted to say, you know, my creative mentor, Dr. Mills, was asked the same question. And his answer is basically a summary of all the great minds, uh, all of the great sadhus, all the great spiritual leaders that, I, that I've met. Uh, and it's to wake up, do everything, use all the resources that you have uh, to, uh, to wake up. Uh, and what that means, it's just an expansion of consciousness. And it's the only thing, everything else we do in our society is a band-aid. Uh, because if it's not done with a higher consciousness, with a desire to achieve a higher consciousness, and live your perception of reality from a universal perspective. It's only temporary. And I, I'd say, uh, whatever is going on in the world right now, uh, see how you can contribute. Um, uh, try to stay in the universal mindset every day. It's a practice. It's a yogic practice. You can call it yoga. You can call it spirituality. But it grows with time, and it becomes second nature. And that's the advent of a higher consciousness. And that's what will change one thought at a time, that which will change our planet. And don't look at what's happening from a negative standpoint. When you mention Mahakranti, when Babaji uh, uh, mentioned Mahakranti, it implies change, change hurts. It's painful to to go through change. Uh, but it's, it can, if you look at it through a universal perspective, it can also be pleasurable. Realize one thing that creativity and art is all about transformation. I mean, the artist will take a certain aspect of reality and filter it through his inspiration and create something different from it. Don't, don't, uh, don't look at the, the, the glass that's always half empty. Uh, there's always something uh, positive that comes from transformation. A volcano that explodes destroys the cities around it, but it, crea- it creates a carbon-rich soil that will, uh, that will uh, make uh, 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 plants grow three times faster than before. So that's what you have to look at, you know? Yeah, recognize, recognize the permanent, like Yogi would say. Don't look what's temporary in you, but look towards what's eternal exactly. and divine in you, and then let the rest unfold. Thank you so much, Claude. Thank you. Uh, thank you for accepting the invite. And uh, I thank you all for watching. Uh, please like and subscribe. And of course, if you have something to say and you want to have a conversation here with me and spread your message and clarify what's important to you, contact me and uh, let's talk and I'll see you all very soon.